Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here and tuning in. Today we'll have a situational update from Commissioner Morrison and General Roy from FEMA. There are a couple of things I want to emphasize this morning. First of all, if you were impacted by flooding, get your debris to the right of ways. If you weren't impacted and want to help, find a neighbor who needs help with their debris and get it to the edge of the street or road. Municipalities need to get this cleaned up as soon as possible so we can get the transition to recovery. And more on that in a few minutes. Second, I know it's difficult for many who are dealing with flooded homes to think about anything other than taking care of your families and your, your own, um, your own uh, dilemma. But it's really important, especially if you're in a county that hasn't been designated yet to report your damage to 211. If there's one takeaway from the presser, it should be to report your damage. If your house, basement, or garage flooded, if you have any damage to your home or property as a result of these storms, and that includes driveways, equipment, and vehicles, it's pretty broad. Please report it to 211. You may not think you need the help, but by reporting your damage, you're helping your neighbors because I know what you're thinking. I don't want to take money away from those who need it. I've heard that a lot from Vermonters over the last week. But in order for a county to receive an individual assistance designation, they need to meet a certain threshold. This will help FEMA make its determinations about eligibility for everyone in the county. And we actually have some good news on this front, and General Roy will update us on that in just a moment. But we still need folks to please call 211 to report your damage. It doesn't commit you to anything. Next, we're also going to discuss support for our businesses. Many Vermonters impacted by flooding are eligible for individual assistance through FEMA, which we just talked about. But as you've heard, businesses are not eligible for individual assistance. They're only able to get loans from the SBA. For many, this isn't enough. And for some, it's not a viable option to take on more debt, or they need financial help to open their doors immediately. Right now, there are businesses that are making tough choices about how to pay for repairs so they can bring their employee, employees back to work and take care of their customers. And some are wondering whether it's worth reopening at all. So these are businesses um, that provide jobs, jobs, groceries, building supplies, prescriptions, and other goods, goods and services that are critical to serve Vermonters and fully recover. So we've got to do something to help. I've instructed my team to get creative on how the state, with its limited resources, can work to fill gaps and prevent closures, job losses, and other outcomes that would be detrimental to our economy. While we're still developing some of these initiatives, Secretary Curley, Treasurer Pichek, and Commissioner Bolio will discuss the first steps we're talking about to help provide direct financial assistance to businesses who are impacted. Now, I want to be clear. We know this won't be enough. We'll need Congress to come through to give a bigger lifeline to our impacted employers. And while I know our congressional delegation is working on behalf of Vermont to do just that, we need to take these steps. Next. Thousands of Vermonters continue to step up to volunteer and offer a helping hand. We need to keep the momentum going. So we're giving all state employees the ability to volunteer for eight hours with supervisor approval to lend a helping hand. I know many have also wondered about a revival of the Vermont Strong license plates. We will be bringing them back with a slightly new design and that will also raise uh, funds for flood relief and recovery efforts. We'll have more on that in uh, the next uh, few days. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. 
I will, I will provide some updates on emergency operations, as well as debris removal, guidance on debris removal, and volunteering. And mostly, I will be discussing the importance of using 211. So regarding preparation for the current rain event, Swiftwater assets are staged throughout the state to respond to any emergencies. Today's, in today's weather, the main threat is localized flash flooding where multiple lines of heavy rain showers and or thunderstorms can move through the same area repeatedly in, and are the same areas that have received a lot of rain. We already saw a band go through, but be clear there are more storms coming. Between 2 p.m. and 8 p.m., we expect to see severe storms that may include high winds, dangerous lightning, and two to three inches of local rainfall. Please take good care and let's get through this last band of severe weather. A quick word about volunteering and donations. There are many communities in need of support. The best type of, of donation that you can make is a financial donation or by volunteering your times and time and talents. Please sign up at vermont.gov forward slash volunteer if you can help. As far as donations go, cash is king. Please donate to a reputable charitable organization. If you'd like to donate food, please do, do so by working with a local food pantry. Donations of clothing and other items should be coordinated with a local charity. All of this information about volunteer coordination and the upcoming words I'll have to say about debris management are available at vermont.gov forward slash, slash debris. I will echo just briefly what the governor said about getting your debris to the right of way as soon as possible, within 10 feet of the right of way. The hauling away period does not last terribly long. Town emergency management directors should contact the State Emergency Operations Center if your town needs direction on how to accomplish this. I'd like to talk a little bit about 211 and then we're gonna have a short show and tell. As we shifted from emergency operations to initial recovery work, 211 showed a backlog of voice messages and incidents entered via the electronic form. We responded in two ways. First, by adding additional resources for callbacks to those who had left messages. This surge in personnel was thanks to AmeriCorps VISTA workers who were organized by Serve Vermont. Second, the team at the Agency of Digital Services established mechanisms to swiftly access all of the reports to 211 made online. Additionally, we adopted new technology in the form of crisiscleanup.org, used by voluntary organizations active in disaster, more commonly known as VODA, to connect those who have indicated they sustain damage and need assistance to volunteer organizations and municipally-based volunteer efforts to assist them. Yesterday, we loaded a batch of, of 211 reports, over 1,100 of them, into the crisis cleanup platform. We continue to ask volunteer organizations and municipalities to use crisis cleanup to match reported needs for cleanup assistance. Also, as of yesterday, approximately 500 business damage reports that were entered into 211 were relayed to the Department of Economic Development. They will be hosting a call with affected businesses, the SBA, FEMA, and the USDA at 4 o'clock today. To sign up for that webinar and to see other business recovery information, you can visit accd.vermont.gov. If you have not reported your residential or business damage to 211, or if you are in need of help with cleanup, we strongly recommend you to visit vermont211.org online to file a report. If you cannot get online, consider asking a friend or family member to help you do so. If you have filed a 211 report already and you provided a phone number, you will receive a text message asking whether or not you still need assistance, and it will have a link to add additional information so that you can report your needs in the crisis cleanup platform. This is part of the new capabilities related to your 211 report. Please remember that this text will not ask for financial or personal information. The most important message that the media and elected officials can share today 
is that making a report to 211 to document damage to residences or businesses is the best way that we can help Vermont move forward. We need to report all damage, as the governor said, it's residences, driveways, yards, vehicles, everything that this flooding damage has accounted for. The data and information we collect here will help us secure federal recovery resources that will propel us into building things back better than ever. We strongly encourage you to make these reports online at vermont211.org. If you choose to call 211, please understand that you may need to leave a message. You will receive a call back. We'd like to show you how easy it is to follow a report, file a report on vermont211.org. Okay, thanks John for going to the website. On the home page, you will select a resident form. You can see that there is a separate form for businesses. Up top, as you scroll down, up top, there will be fields to enter when the damage occurred. And of course, the next few fields will be about who the reporting party is and where the damage is located. The form will ask how many people are in your household and their age range and whether you or anyone in your household has health or mobility issues. Most of these fields on this form are drop-down menus or check boxes. Then there are 21 questions about the nature of the damage to your home, including whether it's your primary residence or one you rent. You may not know the answers to some of the questions, but that's okay. There is an unknown option. There are a couple of questions about whether the reporting party has insurance. And lastly, there is an opportunity for the reporting party to request volunteer assistance for unmet needs. If your needs do not appear on the drop-down menu, please use the box to explain what you need. Completing the form for the first time should take as little as 10 minutes. You will receive a link to your form after you submit it that allows you to go back in and add additional information or photos. Thank you, John. I will now turn things over to our Federal Coordinating Officer, Will Roy. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. On July 4th, President Biden approved a disaster declaration for six counties uh, for individual assistance and a, uh, emergency protective measures for the state of Vermont. The President added uh, for 100 percent funding for emergency protective measures to the state for a 30-day period uh, at the state's choosing within 120 days. Federal funds are available for affected individuals in Chittenden, Lamoral, Rutland, Washington, Wyndham, and Windsor counties. As the governor said, we got good news today that the president approved two additional counties, Caledonia and Orange. FEMA continues to work with Vermont to assess the damages in the other impacted counties. For those who have applied for assistance from Caledonia and Orange counties, your applications will go forward automatically. If your address is not in a declared county, you can still apply online. Your application will be processed uh, if your county is added at a, a later date. Residents should document their damage and contact their insurance agents as they begin cleanup efforts. Residents should also report damage to the state by dialing 211 or visiting vermont211.org. FEMA is establishing disaster recovery uh, resource centers where survivors can go to sign up for assistance to seek uh, 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 questions about their applications or sign up for FEMA assistance. We're opening up two disaster resource centers uh, starting with a soft opening today and tomorrow. Uh, one is in Rutland at uh, Asa Bluma Building, uh, 88 Merchant Road in Rutland. And the second one uh, is tomorrow at the Armory in Waterbury, 294 Armory Drive, Waterbury. The deadline to apply for assistance is September 12, 2023 for the six original counties and 60 days from today for Orange and Caledonia counties. To apply for assistance, visit Disaster assistance.gov or you can download the FEMA app at the Apple Store or Google Play or you can call FEMA's helpline at 1-800-621-FEMA. Say again, 1-800-621-FEMA. 
They are open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily. They also have uh, captioned telephone service uh, and other ability to, to talk with those who don't speak English as a primary language. Disaster survivor assistance teams will go out to the communities, visit homes and businesses. Uh, we're preparing for the potential, so we, because of the new addition, those teams are already moving forward into Caledonia and Orange counties. Uh, to date, FEMA has approved fifth, over $1.5 million uh, in assistance. Uh, we have dispersed, as of today, $1.1 million to those for individual assistance. Uh, and we've received 1,971 registration requests. We have six mobile registration intake centers throughout the state. We're supporting the state's two uh, multi-agency resource centers. And we have our disaster survivor assistance uh, in 12 of the Vermont communities. FEMA is not working alone with the federal government. Uh, we also have partners in the Small Business Administration who are uh, both in our disaster recovery centers. They also have their business recovery centers. Uh, and, and Small Business Administration has, has already received 118 applications for their low interest loan, loans for the businesses. Uh, USDA uh, Food and Safety Inspection Service is also part of our team. And lastly, the Environmental Protection and our Army Corps of Engineers are assisting with assessments for both wastewater treatment plants as well as hazardous waste. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I'll be followed by uh, Secretary Curley. Ma'am? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Our team at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, ACCD, has been working hand-in-hand -hand with local economic development officials, the Small Business Administration, and FEMA to understand, share, and communicate the federal programs available to assist our businesses in their recovery efforts. We'll continue to do this in the days, weeks, and months ahead and communicate the latest from from the federal level as we hear more. <clears throat> but the governor mentioned our business community is struggling to come back online following this flood and to date there are few options for financial support to reopen outside of what is available through federal disaster loans through the SBA. We have heard the business community loud and clear in order to reopen they need more help than a loan can provide. Business owners are tired, they are nervous, and they are looking for more support than these disaster loans can provide. And I want to say it again, we hear you, we see you, and we are working to bring you support and help. We, our team has been working behind the scenes since the flooding began, working across state agencies to find a way to bring state level relief in the form of grants. Today, we're pleased to announce that we are working to stand up a business assistance grant program. The Business Restart Gap Assistance Program will be administered by the Department of Economic Development and will provide $20 million directly to impacted businesses and not-for-profits who suffered physical damage due to the severe flooding in the form of grants. The program is still under development and program specifics will be released next week. Business owners can expect grants to support demonstrated losses to their physical space and replacements of inventory, machinery, equipment, and supplies. This program is intended to provide emergency gap funding to businesses so they can return to being the economic engines of their local communities. We understand the pressing need for financial support, and while this funding will not make them whole, we hope it will make a swift impact in helping them bring back their employees and reopening their doors. As I speak, our dedicated team, tasked with swiftly implementing this program, is working tirelessly on the details, and we're committed to making this process as efficient and transparent as possible in the days ahead. 
Again, we do not yet have all the details in place, but we wanted to make this announcement today so that businesses know that help is on the way from the state. We'll update businesses on program specifics, eligibility, and the grant application opening date next week. At this time, businesses are encouraged to collect, document, and prepare photographs of damage, insurance adjuster damage assessments, estimates for repairs, and or actual paid expenses. We understand that recovery from such a catastrophic event requires a collective effort. The arrival of this state funding does not mean people should stop donating to the many private fundraisers that have popped up. These are important private funds intended to support businesses as well. And just like our community members, local organizations, and neighboring businesses, we've come together to support one another and extend a helping hand wherever possible. We're working with the treasurer to ensure additional tools will be available as additional gaps present themselves, again, in the days and weeks ahead. At this point, I'll turn it over to Treasurer Pichek to talk about what his office is doing to help bridge some of those gaps. Treasurer. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay, and I first want to just thank the governor and his team for their leadership during this crisis. Uh, I know firsthand that this is a team that um, can step up and get it done during a crisis, and as a Vermonter, I just appreciate your hard work and what you've done uh, to respond and what you will do to respond in the coming weeks uh, and months. I also want to thank our treasurer's office staff who we also were impacted in our office and had to work remotely and shift to a backup site but we continue to make sure people continue to get paid in the state, that, employ that uh, retirees got their pension payments, uh, that things continue to operate smoothly and efficiently. So I want to thank our treasurer staff as well. First, I want to announce that uh, our treasurer's office plans to advance payments that were due to 40 of the hardest hit towns in Vermont that would be owed to them in this fiscal year. So that will total about $11 million of uh, quick relief to those municipalities so that they have cash on hand to continue to do their relief work, continue to clean up and get their communities back on their feet. This money will be important as they wait for FEMA reimbursement. Uh, this money will be important to reduce any borrowing costs that might otherwise be incurred uh, if they had to go out to get additional cash to continue their cleanup efforts. So this $11 million to the 40 hardest hit towns is something that is immediate that can get money to their pocket to continue their relief efforts. Also, as Lindsay had mentioned, uh, earlier this year we had announced an expansion of a local investment program of $85 million that was available for housing uh, and for climate action. Obviously, housing and climate action are critical needs, but the immediate response to the flood is more important at this moment. Uh, so we have put a pause on that program uh, while we wait to see what the gaps are uh, that emerge from the business community, from municipalities, from other organizations across Vermont. So we stand ready uh, to help the administration deploy these additional resources uh, if and when they become available. I'd also like to uh, mention that the Vermont banking uh, industry, uh, the Vermont Economic Development Authority, the Vermont Bond Bank, we've been working closely in concert with them. They all stand by ready, willing, and able to help as well as gaps uh, potentially emerge in terms of state and federal funding. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Commissioner Bolio. Thank you, Treasurer Pichak, and good morning, everybody. I'm here today to provide additional details about the governor's announcement on Wednesday that extended Vermont tax due dates for those impacted by the flooding. We know that so many Vermonters around the state are dealing with cleaning up their homes and businesses and supporting their communities on the road to recovery. And in these urgent situations, we do not want anxiety about filing taxes to be added to their burdens. As a result, on Wednesday, the governor directed the Vermont Department of Taxes to extend tax deadlines for Vermonters impacted by the flooding. This means that taxpayers who are unable to meet Vermont tax deadlines that fall between July 7th, 2023 and November 15th, 2023 will now have until November 15th, 2023 to file and pay taxes. For some tax types, these extensions will be granted automatically and affected taxpayers will not need to reach out to the department to request them. 
Those automatic extensions include return, uh, tax returns and tax payments that fall between those July 15th and November, uh, sorry, July 7th and November 15th deadlines and include the following tax types. Corporate and business income taxes, including estimated payments, sales and use tax, meals and rooms tax, and Vermont payroll withholding tax, as well as the associated uh, health care fund contribution. In addition, there is relief for Vermont personal income taxes. For those impacted by the flooding, the department will automatically extend the September 15th, 2023 deadline for personal income tax estimated payments, as well as fiduciary income tax estimated payments. And that extension will also be until November 15th, 2023. And for the last automatic extension, the filing due date for tax year 2022, Vermont personal income taxes, the extended due date, uh, for those who have a valid federal or Vermont extension will automatically be moved from October 16th to November 15th. I would note that these extensions do not apply to the April 18th for paying 2022 Vermont personal income taxes. That April deadline was before the eligibility period for this relief that begins on July 7th. I also want to note that for taxpayers who have other uh, Vermont tax returns or payments coming due between July 7th and November 15th, those returns are also eligible for an extension, though not automatically. And you can request one by contacting our, uh, the department's Taxpayer Services Division for assistance. Phone numbers for various sections of the Taxpayer Services Division are available at the department's website at tax.vermont.gov forward slash directory. I would also stress that these extensions are for those impacted by the severe flooding around the state. Taxpayers who are not impacted by the flooding are expected to file and pay taxes by their original due dates. In some cases, the department may request proof of hardship before granting an extension. But for those who need the relief, we want to make it easy to get. I will close by encouraging folks who want the latest tax-related information about the flooding to visit our website at tax.vermont.gov forward slash flood, which has a number of resources, including all of the details of the state tax relief that I'm discussing today, as well as a link to IRS guidance for those impacted by the flooding to understand the accommodations that are being made for federal taxes as well. We all have to pay our taxes. They are the price we pay for civilized society, and they are what allow us to fund uh, response efforts like these and the swath of government services that we provide to Vermonters. But I also acknowledge that there's a time for those in need to get a little breathing room. And we are hopeful that this, uh, these extensions will do that and ease a small part of the burden for the folks who are dealing with this terrible situation. I thank the governor for his support of Vermont taxpayers and our department's efforts at this time. Uh, I thank you all, and I will now hand it off to Secretary Tevitz. Uh, good morning, uh, Anson Tebbets for the uh, Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Um, you may recall we had another weather event in May uh, which impacted a lot of our, uh, our producers, our farmers, and that was the big freeze that happened in May. And just about a half hour ago we got a response. Uh, the governor had written uh, USDA and asking for a disaster declaration related to the freeze uh, that occurred in, in May. And we got a response uh, just before 11 o'clock today on that. And I'll just read a paragraph or two to get a, a flavor of what, uh, what the Secretary has uh, decided to do. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture uh, reviewed the loss assessment reports and determined that there were su sufficient production losses to warrant a secretarial natural disaster designation. Therefore, I'm designated all 14 counties as primary natural disaster areas. This is related uh, to the freeze. Uh, we've also, in a separate one, uh, sent a letter uh, to the secretary asking to have a USDA declaration related to the flood event. So the data is still being uh, collected on that. And we did get some new figures for you. The last time we were together, I think we had about 7,000 acres 
uh, that were impacted by the flood. And as they calculate that and as farmers report into USDA, we have some updated figures on that. Uh, we are up to, as of about 11 o'clock this morning, we're up to 9,424 acres of uh, loss uh, in acreage, and that impacts about 200 of uh, farmers and producers. So it's very important that farmers continue to report those losses to their farm service agency through USDA. Uh, there is a lag in the reporting. There's probably many more farmers that are behind that have already reported but haven't got to this level and the state level. So I'd always encourage everyone uh, to continue to uh, report their losses uh, through USDA and also place a phone call or, as we mentioned, uh, get on 211 as well so we can get those uh, programs up and running. That is it from the Agency of Agriculture. I'll open up to questions. Secretary Curley, I had a couple of questions about the uh, $20 million grant program. I just came from the press conference downtown with Montpelier business owners who estimate uh, it's going to cost about $20 million for the 100 businesses that have been affected by the flood to recover. Uh, so that's just Montpelier. Uh, is the $20 million in your mind the start uh, and more to come? And, and secondly, is there at this time a cap on what's available to each business? So to your point, we know that this will not make our business owners whole. This is absolutely um, intended to be emergency bridge funding that will hopefully enable business owners to begin the process of doing the cleanup, doing the repairs that will ultimately get them to bringing employees back and opening their doors. We recognize that uh, 20 million is going to need to be spread far and wide. And that's why, as you heard from the treasurer and you've heard from the governor, we need to work with a variety of different people to be really creative, to find resources. I'm encouraging people to continue the, the philanthropic um, donations that they're doing. People have been generous. We're going to need all of that and, and then some. So again, I recognize what you're saying. Um, I can't promise additional monies. You know, you know, our legislators, our leadership is very supportive of getting help to the, to the business owners as well. But um, as you know, it, there's a process, and Secretary Clauser can, can speak more on that, but there's a process that we don't, you know, I personally, you know, in my agency, I don't have the walking around money to just deploy this. It takes, it's a heavy lift to find that money, and we are looking under, in, in every corner, under every cushion to, to find money to help. And is there a cap initially on the emergency fund? So we are still designing that program, so we will share more. There, there will likely have to be because we want to make sure that, that we can share this, but we also want to make sure that it is impactful. But when we have those details, we'll share them. We, again, want to make sure that this is efficient, that it's equitable, and that it's transparent. Secretary, similarly, you brought up um, private philanthropic efforts did like go fundings and thinking of and is that going to be taken into consideration when you're doling out this money and say if a business already got fifty thousand dollars from the funding? So again the pro uh, we're still trying to design the program and um, we are looking to uh, really focus on net uh, loss so so we definitely want to take into account um, if somebody has insurance coverage. So to the extent we can look at other uh, sources of income, but understand we also don't want to delay unnecessarily. So we're still developing more information to come, but we're going, again, we're going to work as hard as we can to make sure that it is equitable and can take those considerations in, but uh, more to come next week on this. One thing from the press conference this morning that I actually wasn't there, but my colleague told me um, was a topic of conversation is that business owners, um, even beyond getting relief now, they're thinking, if I'm flooded out again in five, ten years, like, is it worth it? Why bother reopen if I have to go through this again? Is that something that you all are thinking of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we hope that businesses will think about ways that they might um, do a little mitigation. Uh, you know, they can use this grant money how they want to rebuild it. Again, the goal is to get their employees back and open the doors, but if they want to use it for some mitigation efforts, that is fine. Um, the SBA loans, 
allow for the disaster loans allow for an additional 20 percent to be borrowed uh, if folks are willing to use that on resilience and mitigation so we are absolutely encouraging people to be thinking about that because to your point i wouldn't want to be um, having to to do this again in you know a year or five years or ten what about in the case of if uh, a business owner is renting their storefront and they might not be able to make structural changes so again you know we have to hope that they'll work with their landlords on that and they may not um, again we there's only you know so much I can do with you know with this program but um, as I mentioned folks can use the money the you know the way they want to bring their business back online so um, we're hoping that they're working with their landlords Commissioner Morrison, at, the, uh, at that same press conference that Sarah was talking about that I was at, there was a plea from my player business owners to have the state present them with very solid information about sort of the toxic waste that is now seeping through their community in terms of mud and debris and whatnot. They feel like they need help understanding what to do. Uh, is that something you're preparing to do? So that is something that under the umbrella of the State Emergency Operations Center would be tasked out to the people with subject matter expertise. That's not something that would live in the public safety wheelhouse. But of course, we have representatives from AHS and specifically the Department of Health who we could uh, leverage to present information to the business community. I know that following the 4 p.m. thing uh, around uh, funding for small businesses, we could easily tack on additional um, information sessions for topics that are of mutual interest across the state to small businesses. But to your point, sure, it's a, it's a very real thing. You've heard the governor and I talk about how yucky the floodwaters are and the silt that's left behind. So it's, it's a very real concern, and we are happy to provide whatever informational resources the business community would like to hear about. Governor, uh, flood control. Uh, I spoke yesterday with, with uh, Julie Moore and Ann R. Uh, and if I understood right, uh, the floodplain is, is to be used to mitigate flooding. Uh, but right now, we have whole downtowns and mobile home parks that are in these floodplains. And we're planning on building, uh, building up our residential downtowns as you know, the solution for a housing problem. How, how are we going to get out of this every 10 year flooding of these, these major housing uh, centers? Well, some of the, uh, the flood mitigation measures when you're building new, uh, let's say, or you're building in a uh, multi-story uh, building are, are much different than they used to be. Um, yeah. when, you're, when you're building new, for instance, uh, you might not put anybody on the first floor. Uh, you would put people second, third, fourth floor. Uh, you might put uh, things that uh, could be, uh, allow the water to come through on the, on the first floor. And those, those practices uh, are being talked about and, and incorporated in anything new at this point. And that's why it's sometimes so expensive to build now when we talk about uh, the, the costs of, of providing housing in some of the downtowns in, in any area uh, where it could be prone to flooding. Um, you have to consider elevation, elevators, elev elevation of, uh, of the buildings themselves and so forth. So. Um, we uh, we are well aware of that, uh, and uh, but I think again uh, with uh, proper engineering, uh, you can accomplish both. Uh, those eight hours uh, is that paid volunteer time for state yes. employees? Yes, oh, that's good. Uh, also, my man on the ground in Barrie says that uh, it's been almost two weeks now. And there's no laundry mats in Barrie. There's no, no place to close. Any any thoughts about that? Well, I know that uh, I know FEMA actually has uh, something like that uh, that I've heard about, um, but but I, we haven't talked about uh, the, that need uh, right now. But um, but we're certainly willing to, to consider something to alleviate the concern there. 
What have you guys heard about um, maybe schools in the area that have been damaged from the flood? I believe Montpelier High School is flooded. What other schools have you guys heard that has dealt with severe damage? And I guess just the concern level there where a month or so from now, class will be back in session. Yeah, yeah. I don't know um, the, the extent of schools. I know there has been uh, damage in some schools throughout the state. Uh, but I don't have a listing of that at this point. Uh, is okay, um, Secretary Boucher. Uh, if you have the answer to that, uh, that would be helpful. Reporting damages to 211, but also reporting them directly to FEMA. Do people need to do both, or is it one or the other? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, absolutely do 211 uh, because that helps the state understand where the damages are, and it also helps us uh, where to send uh, our assessors along with the state and locals to take a look at the properties to see what the damages are. So do both, please. <coughs> <laughs> um, what about for counties that haven't been added to the declaration yet? Is there any sort of deadline for them to provide proof of damages? No. Um, and we continue to work alongside the state and the locals to assess all the homes. And that's why 201 is so important. Because uh, sometimes you just don't know. We all live in. I live in a rural community, sometimes you just don't know where it's at. So if you report to 201, that allows us to, to, to say, okay, we have to go to this location and take a look at the property and see what the damages are. Uh, so it, yes, overall helps us very, very much. Do you have any sort of timeline for how long it may take for more counties to be added? If they're added, I know we're in Leeds County, I've heard a lot of support mm -hmm. going on that. I, I can't speak to the timeline for that. Uh, I can tell you that we, uh, are constantly working with the state and locals to find other properties uh, to take a look at to, to assess the damages and and we ask the public and thank you for, for putting this out we ask the public hey if you know a neighbor has had damages ask them if they've reported it and if they haven't please help them you know report it they may not have internet uh, you know but help them report it they can call it in you know that that information provides critical uh, uh, information we need to assist the state could you remind us again what happens to a homeowner who has suffered extensive damage in an undeclared county? And let's say that county never gets declared, uh, but there are pockets uh, of communities in that county where there has been severe damage. What recourse do they have? Uh, so I can speak to what FEMA does, uh, um, and, and I'll start with you know what we call the sequence of delivery uh, on how FEMA provides assistance. But it always starts and ends with volunteers, right? We know volunteers are the first ones out there that are helping along with first responders. Uh, but as, as you go through all the different uh, processes, uh, at the end of the day, there is gonna be an unmet need. Uh, and that's where we look to volunteerism to help fill that unmet need. Uh, so for those who are in undeclared counties, if they do have damages, they can still go uh, online to FEMA or call in and have their homes uh, uh, listed and have a, have a case number. And much like they did in Caledonia, as well as in Orange, as soon as you know those are declared, it's an automatic process. It starts off. Now, for those who are in undeclared counties, when they do that, they're going to get a notification that your application you know, is currently on pause because you're not in a declared uh, county. Uh, but once it, but once it gets turned on, should it get turned on, their, their applications will go forward automatically. And really, the first thing that's going to happen is they'll get a call from a home, a, a housing inspector, to take a look at the damages at home, and that's where the process starts. And again, so in brief, for those in undeclared counties, 
You know, there are a number of other uh, volunteer organizations that they can work with, and of course, we we'll always start with insurance as well. So, just to be clear, if you're a homeowner in an undeclared county, in a county that never gets declared, and you you suffered extensive damage, uh, there's no avenue for you to recover from FEMA. That is correct, sir. And thank you for that clarification. Speaking of insurance, this is admittedly very anecdotal, but I've heard from some homeowners that they are concerned that if they report damages to their insurance company and then go to a one in FEMA, that their insurance premiums are going to hike up after the fact. And they don't even know how much money they could qualify for from FEMA or um, state. And so do you have any sort of message for those folks? Well, but in order to qualify for assistance from FEMA, you have to apply, uh, notify your insurance company and have that adjudicated. Whether, whether they pay you or not, you know, we need to see that uh, because you have insurance. Uh, so that, that has to start the process. We have, yes, sir. Yeah. We have Commissioner Gaffney uh, on right now. He might be able to answer some of those questions. Yes, Governor, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gaffney of the Department of Finance and Regulation. Uh, and to that question, we, we did already provide industry uh, guidance on this, that this event will not impact uh, any policyholders' uh, premiums. So um, they should be encouraged to file the claim with their insurance company because that is part of the process uh, to access FEMA resources in addition to 211. So they should be reaching out to their agent. They don't have an agent, reach out to directly to their company. We've been in conversations with the companies uh, as recent as yesterday and uh, re-emphasizing all of the messages we delivered and the companies are acknowledging and agreeing with the direction we're giving. And I'll just say one other thing, we're also ask, um, advising um, companies to be lenient with policyholders with extended grace periods, understanding that they can't access their homes or their roads are, are closed, so in terms of just policy billing and policies being active and not canceled. We've issued uh, through this emergency the request of the industry to show that lenience for Vermonters. Can you hear me if I'm not on the microphone? Yeah, okay. Uh, when you say the department is issuing guidance, like, does that mean it's mandatory? Is there any sort of check to make sure that the insurance companies actually follow this guidance? Are there any repercussions if they don't? So I can speak to, I was here during Irene, and I can speak to, we issued similar guidance during Irene, and we had uh, compliance uh, with that. We do have a consumer services line that monitors these activities and would get feedback. If any consumers are having any issues with their policies canceling or non-renewing, or their policies being rated because of this event, they should reach out to the Department of Financial Regulation and we'll assist. Thank you. Go to the phones now. We'll start with Tim McQuizzen, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, hey, Governor. Thanks for all this. Uh, one of the questions that came up during COVID for employers was whether to lay off their employees. As it turns out, um, the PUA was very important to employers, and um, it, it kind of caught the employers in between, and, and some of them, frankly, made mistakes on what they did. Is there any, there hasn't been much um, yet so far, maybe uh, Commissioner Harrington can weigh in on um, filing for uh, a UI. Uh, is there any guidance on whether uh, businesses should lay off their employees now and then um, wait to see if there's further assistance? Yeah. Some have already, um, Tim, and um, there is another program uh, that we're starting up with another acronym, um, but I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner Harrington talk about that. Uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you, Tim. Um, so as the Governor mentioned, there is another program with regards to laying off staff. If, if staff are not uh, working, um, they are eligible to be filing for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, you know, in terms of what is best for the employer, I think that's that's really up for them to decide. Uh, it doesn't, um, in typical situations such as natural disasters, there isn't necessarily additional benefit programs that
that will likely be coming. Um, to your point about uh, the fact that you know there seem to be new uh, programs being rolled out, uh, you know, every few weeks during the pandemic. So I think in this case, um, you know, it's up to the employer to decide what is best for them. Um, but you know, they they should make that decision knowing what they know now in terms of the programs that are available. Um, with regards to unemployment insurance, uh, you know, just knowing the population uh, of Vermont's workforce, many individuals will be eligible for regular traditional unemployment insurance benefits, um, but those that uh, are not uh, may be eligible for the Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program, uh, which the department announced yesterday. Again, uh, the DUA program is specific to those counties that have been identified, um, but anyone who is uh, whose work wages um, has been impacted uh, should first file for traditional unemployment insurance, which they can do through our website. They can also do it by calling uh, our unemployment assistance call center, but there is an online application uh, for filing. And, and if they do that, the department will determine whether or not they fall into the uh, traditional unemployment insurance category or whether they may be eligible for the disaster unemployment assistance program. Michael, have you seen a, a spike in the last few days in, in claims? Uh, not uh, not a huge spike, certainly an increase. Uh, individuals who have been impacted, again, both in the, the traditional unemployment space and, and those that have indicated that their, um, their claim is flood related. Uh, and um, it's a little bit of a, a math game um, because there are a couple different ways to file for benefits depending on whether you're a new applicant or somebody who already had a claim uh, open in the last 12 months. Um, but we have seen uh, a number of uh, claims come through where individuals indicated that um, their separation from employment was flood related. All right, thank you very much. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, my question is, uh, Orleans County got hit pretty hard. Is there any update as to when they might start getting a uh, FEMA declaration? Yeah, we're waiting to hear about that. But um, but again, I'll take this opportunity to advocate uh, for those in other counties who haven't been designated to call 211 with their, with their damage declaration to fill out the form, uh, report that, uh, and that will get us uh, to where we hope to get to, uh, which is a declaration uh, for those um, community members. So again, I, I can't stress enough how important this is, and it's, uh, it, 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 it makes the determination uh, whether we get the funding uh, in those counties. So. Um, it's 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 just simply a matter of them filling out the forms. And is there any um, any information on how well our wastewater uh, treatment plants have uh, have fared during the uh, this stormy weather? We have had um, some damage throughout the state. I know of at least three uh, who have been impacted, and there may be more. Uh, that I don't know about, but uh, Secretary Moore is here and she can give us an update. Thank you, Governor. Uh, as the Governor indicated, there are three wastewater facilities in the state that have sustained physical damage to their plants, and then there are approximately nine additional facilities that have received operational damage, meaning high flows entering the plant uh, adversely affected the way the plant is able to operate and treat wastewater. Um, that is part of the reason the agency issued a press release earlier today encouraging people to use caution in entering surface waters this weekend. Um, we know that there continue to be high bacteria levels in a, a number of, of rivers and lakes across the state. Um, so even as the, the immediate flood conditions subside, as we work hard to bring that infrastructure back online and ensure that robust wastewater treatment is being provided, uh, we're not quite there yet and encourage Vermonters to exercise caution. Well, welcome back from vacation. <laughs> and uh, thank you. That's all I have. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, uh, do we have any idea, perhaps through 211 data, of how many people have been displaced over the last two weeks? Um, do we have any figure that we might be able to estimate? 
I don't have that information at my fingertips, but I can take a note and go direct with you, Colin. Um, so I will get back to you after this press conference. Great, thank you. And the only other thing I want to ask is, um, I heard that the Red Cross might be thinking about starting to consolidate some of its shelters, perhaps to the Barry area. I was just wondering if that, have, we, uh, have you been contacted by them about that? Do we have any idea if some of the shelters are going to start winding down and losing people who are commonplace? So we're not closing shelters, and I'll let Secretary Samuelson uh, take the lead on this response. Some of them have been on standby because there's just nobody there at night. But Secretary, take it away. You're muted, Jenny. Several of the shelters have gone down to no clients left there. So there are two shelters that remain open, one at Northern Vermont University and one at the Barry Auditorium. Um, that, that means that we still have a, a capacity of over 150 um, shelter beds uh, available with 11 shelters on standby. Great, thank you. So it's, it's very important, um, again, to emphasize they are, are not closed. Uh, they're just on standby. And we can, we can uh, set them up uh, to operate uh, almost at a moment's notice. Governor, I know, uh, well, I got oh, a point. Sorry about that, Jason. Go one more on the line when we come back through. Keith, Ralph Harold. Hi. Um, there's been a lot of talk of uh, getting people to report the 211 and everything. Do you have any sense, uh, is, are there a lot of people just not doing that for some reason? And if so, do you have any idea why, like what the barriers are? Or? Yeah. I you know, I, I think anecdotally, uh, we've, we've spoken to a lot of people. I've spoken to a lot of people uh, along the, the path here to recovery. And um, some just feel as though they don't want to do it because they want to make sure there's money available for others who are in worse shape than they are. Um, so they say, I can take care of this on my own. Uh, or they think um, they, they only think about uh, damage to their home, for instance. Uh, but this actually covers any property. It's fairly broad. It could be the driveways, uh, as well as uh, out structures, um, equipment, uh, vehicles, and so forth uh, that are that are parked on the property. So uh, I think, uh, again, it's just the uh, getting the education uh, to know, uh, to the understanding uh, that you should report, and that there are many things that qualify. And again, if you don't need it yourself, um, think about your neighbors, uh, because uh, if we don't get enough people and, and don't have, meet the, the threshold, then no one gets it. And Bob's uh, question earlier about what happens to those who are uh, impacted uh, and don't uh, get uh, relief from FEMA. Well, it's because they didn't meet the federal delegate, uh, um, uh, declara declaration amount. And so we, um, we just want you to, to help us meet that threshold so that everyone who is impacted can get the relief they need. Thank you. Uh, Governor, we'll probably have time for one or two more. Yeah, Governor, I know um, Secretary Curley had, had talked a lot about the press conference this morning in Montpelier and the businesses and whatnot, but for those that are, are proclaiming and saying the state isn't doing enough for them, how do you respond to their concerns? and? That, that, that message from them? Well, again, <clears throat> this was a, a storm, a uh, historic storm uh, that lasted multiple, multiple days. Um, I was involved during Irene, and, uh, and I'd have to say uh, we are doing, um, I, I, I can't say enough about all the first responders, uh, the number of people who have uh, stepped up to help, uh, and it's not just our state employees and our state infrastructure, uh, but those from the public and uh, philanthropic uh, organizations and so forth. So uh, I think we're doing uh, as well as can be expected under the circumstances. Can we do better? Uh, always can do better. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, we are in this for the long haul, and uh, we are doing our very best uh, to meet the needs of Vermonters. Do we have anyone from the Department of Health? Oh, right. Set up an interview. Okay. Thank you. Do we know how many homes have been damaged? Do we have an assessment now, and also in the mobile home? Well, again, again, that's why we need the 2-on-1 information. We don't have a complete uh, 
inventory of the number of homes uh, that have been damaged. Uh, and we do have some information, just uh, the number of, um, of mobile home uh, parks and uh, that have been impacted. I, I believe it's 14, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm not positive of that. Josh on the line. Yeah, I don't know if Commissioner Hanford is on the line. He's not, but I do have some numbers that he had as of yes. yesterday. Yes. Okay. So as of yesterday morning, so it's probably changed significantly since then, 2,317 homes reported some sort of damage. Um, 794 total properties. And that includes multifamily rentals, single family, and mobile homes. But that number is fluid as more and more people report. That was as of morning? As of yesterday morning. And we'll try and get the information. I know we have the number of parks um, somewhere. So we can get that to you. I just want to ask a clarifier quick, if, if possible, the federal disaster threshold that we've talked about. Is there a number that you're able to share? What is that threshold? and? What do the communities it's, have to It's a more complicated formula than that. It, it's dependent on population and other factors. Um, I don't know if yes, there's sir. anything to add to that. Yes, sir. Uh, it, as the governor said, it's a very complicated factor. You have to take it in totality. It, homes, you know, da uh, damaged and destroyed are a key factor to that, but there's so many other factors that go with it. You know, the, the uh, uh, per capita income for the county, um, other type of damages there. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sir, it, it, it is, it's, it's, there's a lot of factors to get involved with. Thank you. I have, like, a general, like, mental health question. I don't know if there's a speaker here on the line that maybe fits that expertise, but I think about, like, parents maybe trying to talk to their young children about, like, what's been going on the last week or so, seeing all the flood damage, seeing what's happening across the state. I guess how would you advise, um, you know, just talking to your kids about these natural disasters and what's really going on. Yeah, it's, so a, it's, it's a good point. And uh, we had Commissioner Haas on the other day. I don't know if she's on now, but we can set you up with an interview with, with her and uh, can give that information because it's, it's very important as we go through this. Again, it's going to be a long haul and uh, we're going to have to learn how to deal with this as well. Fourteen mobile home parks. Thank you all very much.